was chaperoning junior prom. And so uh, prom I thought was so interesting because unlike the after game dances or the casual ones throughout the year, everyone was dressed up to the nines. It was a big deal in our um, in our high school days. So I thought this is so beautiful and charming and a lot of the kids are so happy, but what's the darker side of this? Sylvia and me. 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 Hi, I'm Sylvia Beckerman, host of the podcast series, Sylvia and May, conversations with extraordinary, inspiring women. Hi, my name is Ali Condi. I'm the author of several books, including the New York Times bestseller, Matched, which was number one on the list and stayed there for about a year. I also love to eat and read and write and run, and I have four children. I live outside of Utah, and I also love hiking. And welcome to Sylvia and Me. Alan, thank you so much. What a fantastic introduction. See, I didn't have to remember all of that, nor read it off, off a cheat sheet. And as you said, you are the author of the best-selling trilogy, Matched. In fact, 2020 um, marked the 10th year um, anniversary of it being released and immediately going right up the charts. Um, it, what you've written is it called, I believe, um, YA, Young Adults, although we'll get into that because I do not believe it's only for young adults. Um, I know a lot of, uh, and I've asked, I know a lot of grown-ups who are enthralled by the series. So I want to go back a little. Um, how about when you were maybe four and maybe thought about writing? Because I read someplace <laughs> about unicorns and you dictating to your babysitter. So can you kind of go into how it, how it happened? Why your love of, uh, did you have a love of reading, writing? Yes, I'm very impressed. That was a deep dive into the, into the biography. But yes, I, there are unicorns involved in my, in my first work. Um, but back when I was about four, I couldn't write yet, but I had a great babysitter. And so I really, telling stories is sort of how I always made sense of the world as a kid, whether they were fictional or stories about myself or my family. And so she was great because she would kind of take dictation for me. I would have her sit down and I would tell her a story and she would write it all out verbatim, which I appreciate. That's a good, a good secretary right there. <laughs> but yeah. Private, private assistant at, at the age of four. Not many people can say that. I know she was just the best babysitter um, and now that I have kids of my own I think man she was so patient but um, but yeah I, I really loved unicorns as a lot of the small children do and I thought oh I was writing a story about a bunch of unicorns and I thought what's the what's even better than unicorns and it was unicorns with the potential to have more unicorns so all of the unicorns in the story were pregnant and now when you read it it's extremely disturbing <laughs> <laughs> They're just lumbering around, frolicking, and anyway, but that was that was my first work, and my mom is great. She saved that for me, so I still have that rather shockingly horrifying book to read, but, but I did always love writing, and I think that was um, growing up in a family where my parents let us see them reading all the time. Um, neither of my parents are writers um, professionally, but my dad is a great um, well, he is now, now that he's retired, he's published a book about a cross-country road trip he took with my younger sister, but he was a judge and my mom was a visual artist. And so I was around people who really valued reading and learning and my mom valued, well, my dad did too, but my mom was an artist and he valued that and she valued that. And she always made time to create because it was her profession and it was her passion. So those things I think were pretty lucky to grow up around as a kid. I, I don't take that for granted. Well, what kind of books did you read as a child? Oh, I read kind of everything I could get my hands on. I loved the Anna Green Gable series particularly. I remember buying the first book on a vacation when I was in third grade and I read it 32 times that year. I know because every time I finished it, I would flip to the front cover and make one of those marks like prisoners make, but the opposite, I was loving that book. So. So yeah, that was a series that I loved. I also grew up around the time of the original Babysitter's Club books. And so oh, okay. those are having, yeah, those are having a bit of a renaissance right now, but I read tons of those. I love them. And I was a huge Agatha Christie fan. I still am kind of from a youngish age, maybe 11 or 12. My dad gave me one to read. And I just think, I still think her dialogue is so clever and um, the characters she has are so fun. Even if they're in murder mysteries, you're still 
there, there's a lot of humor. Yeah, there's a lot. I, happening. I totally agree. I mean, I started out uh, with Nancy Drew. <laughs> Sorry. Oh yeah, yeah. Nancy Drew and and Sue Barton and then and then the Hardy Boys and then yeah. I got into then I read everything that I, Agatha, Agatha Christie did. Yeah, isn't oh, she fun? <laughs> she definitely. Um, and and it's just it to me reading is something that um, I can escape into. Mm -hmm. and uh, your stories, starting with unicorns, yeah, it's an escape. Um, if it's a nonfiction, it's not, but fiction in, in any format uh, is, is really allowing people to escape into what the writer uh, sees. So yeah. you went through high school um, writing or no writing? A little bit of writing. So like I said, I, it was always sort of how I made sense of the world. So I never finished anything like a novel or a story, but I was always sort of starting things and, and then wandering off from them because high school is all about social life and oh. uh, you know how that is. And I was on the cross country team and track team and it was, it was, high school is a lot of fun, but I did always kind of keep writing. And then um, after that, I went to college and I wanted to become an English teacher because my mom, like I said, is a visual artist and she has gallery exhibitions all the time, but she also taught art. And I kind of saw from her that, hey, you can have a creative life and you can continue to produce, but it's also a little bit tricky to make a living just on your creative work. So I had this great balance of practicality and, and passion, like I said earlier. So, so I thought, all right, I will teach English and then I can kind of write on the side. That will be that will be my gig. And it turns out the only time in my life that I wasn't writing was when I was teaching high school English because I was grading 169th grade research papers and I had no time. So um, there are other teachers I know who are also writers who have made that happen. But for me, that was a tricky combination. So, so yeah, after high school and, and college and teaching, I finally started giving myself time to write when I ended up staying home and after I had my first baby and I thought, all right, if I'm really going to write a book, there's no time like the present. Well, and there wasn't. I understand that prior to Matched, you had several books that you had, uh, had published. Yeah, so I published five books with a small publisher called Shadow Mountain, which is based in Utah. And they've been responsible for some really exciting young adult and middle grade titles over the years, and including Brandon Mull, who's a good friend of mine, who's a New York Times bestselling author who wrote Fable Haven and a bunch of other series. And there were a few of us publishing with them around the same time. So I feel really lucky that I had that shot in the arm of, of working with them, because I don't know that I would have kept going to get to Matched if I hadn't had those smaller books, those successes early on, um, on, that, on that smaller scale and getting to work with editors I really loved. Well, we can move a little bit forward. Um, one of the things that you said, um, as far as finding time to write um, when you were teaching and you know teaching, a lot of women um, will sometimes put their passions aside because they feel that they need to, as, as your mother had said to you, you know, being an artist is great, but you can't always make a living on that. So we have a habit of falling back into something that is a little bit more secure. Mm -hmm. um, and you took the time uh, for being a stay at a home mom to actually write and publish five books. So yeah. in the meantime, I believe that even though being an English teacher, teacher did not give you the time to write, being an English teacher back in 2008 gave you the chance to, um, uh, what do you call it, chaperone, there you go, see word retrieval, chaperone <laughs> the junior prom, which then got you to the storyline or the beginnings of the storyline of MASH. Can you go into that? Yeah, and I think women, I think women are very good at this actually, where even if they're women are creators by nature. And so I think even if we've had to hit pause on that or maybe not participate in it as much as we like, 
we're always, that's always part of us and we're always going to take it in and, and living our lives, we do it in creative ways. So I think I was kind of lucky though um, in that I was chaperoning high school dances which are automatically really interesting and crazy and there's a lot going on in any room. Um, but yeah, I was chaperoning junior prom and um, I chaperoned all the dances because you could make extra money on the weekends and the teachers <laughs> always are in need of a little extra money. And so uh, prom I thought was so interesting because unlike the after game dances or the casual ones throughout the year everyone was dressed up to the nines it was a big deal in our um in our high school they would roll out a literal red carpet and the couples would walk down paired off together and a writer's mind always takes things and takes them to the next step so i thought this is so beautiful and charming and a lot of the kids are so happy but what's the darker side of this you know there's kids who are staying at home who didn't get asked or there are people who are there with people they would prefer not to be with, but they felt, I, I just kind of thought, oh, this is, this is a really interesting construct that we have. And not that I didn't love chaperoning prom or going to my own, but, but I started to think about that a little bit. And I thought, what would this look like taken to an extreme where they weren't choosing who they were pairing off with? And maybe the stakes were even a bit higher. I mean, in high school, prom feels like high stakes for sure. But in the book, <laughs> but in the book, um, they're going to a, to a banquet. They're all dressed up. It's sort of a similar construct to prom, but they're finding out who they're supposed to marry when they turn 17. So yeah, it was absolutely inspired by experiences teaching. So take us into the um, society that you started writing about in Matched. Um, I believe the name of the young lady, Cassia. Good. Yep, it is. Oh, yes, I said it properly. I have a hard time pronouncing so. Oh, I do too. <laughs> but it's a it's a great name because it's a little bit different. Um, and so the society that you built, uh, for some people, it might not even be that different from some countries that they live in. So take us to the opening of Matched and uh, a little bit of Cassia and the society that she was living in. Sure, so the initial idea I had um, was, okay, there's a girl, the government decides who she chooses, and I wanted to show her in motion at the very beginning of the book. So that was one of the few chapters that I wrote that largely stayed the same, even through revision, with the opening scene being her on a train um, going to the government building where they tell you about the banquet. So that scene started out pretty early on. Um, and then I started to build the society around her. So people do this differently. Writers do this differently. Some people, some authors will start out with the world and the history and the plot. Um, I usually start with the character and then I build the world or the society around them. So I was thinking, okay, what, what, what world has to exist for her to be in this circumstance? And I always joke that I'm super lazy and I didn't wanna do historical research because there have been societies <laughs> where you don't get to choose who you married, but I wanted to build something kind of different and new and, and have it be in the future rather than the past. So yeah. I thought a lot about what, would, what it would look like and what choices she would have because it's impossible to eliminate all choice. But what I, what I ended up doing in the book was sort of thinking of the society as a parent because I'm a parent and I was when I was writing this book and I thought it's kind of interesting and, and discomforting almost to realize that choices that I feel so intrinsic to me that I should have, um, I would gladly take away from my children, you know, if I could. <laughs> If I could pick who they married and they, they would be happy forever, I mean, sign me up. I would love to spare them that pain or that it's so hard to watch kids go through the teenage years. It was just brutal. Um, so I started thinking about that too. You know, what would this society have looked like initially because it probably had good intentions? And then how did those get taken to extremes? Those were questions I thought about a lot. And that happens on a regular basis in real life. Yeah. Um, where some choices are taken away. Um, and even though we think we have the choices and, we, and, and people do really um, go about things with the best of intentions, but then it goes off the rails and the choices that we thought we had are no longer available and people are, are making them for us. Um, as women, we have that a lot. Yes. Um, we have or are and have over the last number of years woken up to that. Yeah. Um, and so 
your character, uh, does she wake up to the fact that there are certain things that she wants that, that no matter what the society has dictated to her should happen, uh, she doesn't want that to happen. So is that the conflict that uh, comes into play? Yeah, you phrased that perfectly. And I love the way you said that. Um, yeah, she's waking up. The whole book is about her uh, waking up. She's a what, what, quote unquote, a nice girl. One of the girls that I think a lot of us have been raised to be where um, you don't rock the boat. Um, you Kindness is important. And I totally believe kindness is important and some of those other things, but she starts to realize, wait, I want something and it's actually okay to want those things. It's okay to want a little bit more than what I'm being given. Um, one of the constructs in the book also is that there's only a hundred of everything the government has chosen, a hundred poems, a hundred songs, a hundred stories. That's all the art that you get to have. And I think sometimes, I, I think I was playing with that a little bit because often also as women were told, well, it's already been done or you're not good enough. I think we tell ourselves that a lot too, you know, who am I to add to this conversation? Who am I to try to write a book? And, and there's no, well, there's reasons for that, that our culture have given us and that sometimes we put on ourselves. But the truth is you should, we don't need only a hundred of this or a thousand of that. We need everything. We need what you have to offer as well. So that was something I thought about a lot with her story too. That's great. Um, because as we started off, the books are, we were, is supposedly for the YA, the young adult audience. And yet what we just talked about, there are so many women at any age who are still being held back by them telling themselves, well, um, they can't really do it. It's too late to do it. You know, um, who are they to think they can do it? And, mm -hmm. and all that negativity stops a lot of people and specifically women from moving ahead and doing what they uh, what they would really like to do, at least try it. Uh, you know, as, as a mom, we have, you know, there's a lot of responsibility. Uh, yes, and I've said this many times before, dads do take on some, but the bulk of the responsibility right. does lay on mom. And in the world we're living in now with the pandemic, um, it, it, it really has shown that it lays on mom. Yeah. So in speaking of the pandemic, could you see anything different that you might have put in for the society and, and, and this young girl? Yeah, so uh, ironic, well, ironically or not, the third book in the trilogy is all about a pandemic. So, <laughs> so that book is all about, and it was written obviously several years ago, six for the third book, I think. Um, obviously that's something that I thought of in abstract and I'm now living in in reality in principle and i saw an article you may have seen it too where it said other countries had plans for the pandemic or came up with plans and the us has been the women will handle it and, you know i think that's been <laughs> Uh, I think that's been true. You know, we're handling the online schooling, we're handling the, the emotional ups and downs that our kids are having, um, particularly, and one of the reasons I think it's harder sometimes for women to create um, is because we take on the emotions of our family and our friends and we, and you have to have emotional reserves to create. And so that's tricky. So I think that's probably even harder right now for a lot of us. I know it is for me because you're building everyone up and then you sit down finally to write at the end of the day and you think, you know what I would rather do? Not this, you know, <laughs> I would rather shop for the kids' Christmas pajamas than, than try to generate something new or exciting. But, but yeah, I think that that's something that we're all feeling extra right now. There's always a positive side though too, where I think in order to write or create something good, you have to feel connected. And in a way we're all feeling disconnected from each other. It's hard. For example, I'm not on a real book tour in the sense I'm not in the schools talking to kids like I usually would be, but we are finding it. Um, we're connecting more with the people that matter a lot to us because we're making those extra efforts. And so I wonder, I'm so interested to see what happens when this pandemic is all over. You know, what do we come out of it with? Maybe not necessarily on the page, but what will we now be able to make? Hopefully some pretty great things. I saw, I mean, Stacey Abrams, we're all joking on Twitter about her because she managed to, you know, reorganize the political system in Georgia and apparently write a novel. So all the writers are saying, <laughs> 
what's her excuse? We, we haven't even written our novel and she had a whole other job. So, yeah. so it's, yeah, who knows? <laughs> Listen, some of us can do, you know, this multitasking and this multitasking. Yeah. Um, and as, as women, we multitask, not just in the reality, but also in our heads and yes. trying to plan out everything. So as we're doing the, you know, I don't like saying the future, but something that we have to do later on that, you know, hopefully we have or haven't procrastinated. And like my aunt said to me, so you didn't, you procrastinated. Oh, you have something to do tomorrow. You know, there's, <laughs> always, there's always something. So, I love that. <laughs> so um, the, the last book in the trilogy, you did have a pandemic. Yes. Now, now that we're living through it, is there something that you foresaw? Or is there something that you would change um, because this is the reality? Yeah, I mean, of course you always have empathy for your characters and you care about them, but I feel like I would have had a whole different understanding of how they might be feeling psychologically with this hanging over them now that I've lived through it a little bit more. Um, I did set up the pandemic, so I invented the disease, but I consulted with an immunologist and a pathologist to make it a disease that could exist. Um, but one of the things that we laughed about and spent a lot of time on, as I said, it's a young adult novel and it's romantic, so I still want there to be kissing. So we have to not have it be transmitted. <laughs> <laughs> So that was really fun. Um, they, they laughed pretty hard. They said, well, we're up for the challenge. So we did come up with that. But but yeah, I think that is, I wrote that into the book and I'm joking about it because I think it is funny because it is young adult and romance. But I think, I, I you know, looking back, I gave them a chance to connect. And I think that's one of the things we're missing with the actual reality of this pandemic that we don't get to tailor to our lives is we're not you know, we're not able to kiss and hug and all of those things as much as maybe we would like to. So that's something I've thought about a bit is, you know, that was just a thing I did for the purposes of the book, but for the purposes of real life, man, we miss that, you know, we miss all of those things. Yes, the, the physical, the physical mm -hmm. touch. Um, what I found is I'm able to connect a little bit more like meeting you and, and all of the, the virtual and all the women that I've been able to meet who whose schedules are a little bit more free because mm -hmm. they're not spending that time, that additional time traveling. Um, that, that's a connection that uh, I would like to see amongst so many people to continue. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, it's funny because as far as my talking to people, it's one of the things that has come out of it. Um, there aren't a lot more positive things that have come out, but the connection to people and not losing that and how so many people um, have made it um, their goal to connect with people who, you know, to reach out and touch people in that way and into the virtual world, um, unfortunately, right now, but fortunately for some of the things that allow us to do. Can I ask, how old yeah. are your children? So my oldest is 17, and then I have a 15-year-old, a 12-year-old, and a 9-year-old. Okay. So yeah. you have really, first of all, have they read your books? So the oldest one and the 12-year-old have, and they were very appreciative. I mean, they're my own children, so it's, they were also very honest. Okay. <laughs> But yeah, they have, and that's been really fun. And then my nine-year-old daughter is just starting to pick that up. And all my others are boys who are great, but it's been kind of fun to see her. I have a middle grade novel called Summer Lost and one called The Dark Deep, which are middle school books. And she's been reading those and enjoying them. So that's, that's quite fun. That's wonderful. And um, so you have your hands full. Yes. Because uh, they're all home. And, <laughs> you know, in, in one way, the, the good thing about that is that you don't have to worry about them you, not being able to see them because they're not home. So you can have okay. your holidays together and so on. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, they're home. Right. Um, <laughs> and are you, what are you writing now? Anything? Or are you just sitting back and enjoying and taking in this 10 year anniversary? Uh, well, I'm trying to do that a little bit because I think sometimes, again, as women, we forget to pause and take in the good things, all the work that we did, because there's always more work to be done. 
Um, like I said earlier, it's been tricky to write during the pandemic, especially with everyone home and managing all the online school and all of that. But um, but yeah, I am still working on something. It's another young adult novel. And then I've had some ideas. Um, I can't speak to them yet because they haven't been announced, but there are a couple of genres and age groups that I've never written before that it looks like I will be writing for. So I can't say more than that, but that's pretty exciting that's for me. That's yeah. <laughs> We'll follow up in a few months and, and you'll that be great. Us. So now before we go, I wanted to ask why the uh, young adult audience, why was that, did that have to do with, with your, you know, the time that you were teaching or uh, why that specific audience? Although, as I've said, I know a lot of people who it, it really, the story reaches so many that it, it kind of, is so flexible in, in the age, but why did you specifically focus on the young adult audience? I think it's just an age group I've always been drawn to. You know, I was a high school teacher. I used to coach uh, cross country and track. Um, but I think particularly that age group is interesting because there's a lot of hope there. And so when you're writing a young adult novel, um, you can give them, because they're, young adults are smart. And I do they believe- are. I do believe that they're smarter than we are a lot of the time. And, you know, you're never writing down to them. You're always writing to, to an adult, basically, to someone who's a person in the world. But also when you're writing for young adult, it's the first time these things are happening to the characters. So it's often first love or first government overthrow. You know, it's the first time these things are taking place. And so it's very fun to write about. There's a certain energy and hopefulness in young adult literature that sometimes you don't find in adult literature. Um, I also think that we like reading about it because uh, we've talked about this as young adult authors too. There's not a lot of time to mess around. Kids have a lot of demands on their attention and time and they've got school and everything that's available now online. And so you need to just, it's, it's about telling a good story. And I think that's why a lot of adult readers have come to young adult because we try to get right to the story and make it interesting right from the beginning because we know we need to grab these kids' attention. So that's another thing I find when I'm reading young adult is I really enjoy um, how there's no wasted space. We get to the story pretty quickly and, and I, I love that. So any uh, movie bites, any, you know, are, are we going to be seeing this like the Hunger Games? Because the book was touted as, uh, let's say, compare, compared to the Hunger Games, mm -hmm. a suburb dystopian romance uh, in a star review by the Wall Street Journal. So are we going to be seeing this in movie form anytime soon? So we, I, this is another one of those things that I can only hint at, but- Okay, um, hint is but good. But yeah, hinting is always exciting because that means something's happening. But yes, we it's definitely not dead. Um, and I'm, I'm really hoping that something will come of it because I think it would make for, it's always fun to see your stuff taken by someone else and turned into something else. So I, I would be, I'd be up for that for sure. Oh, you wouldn't turn it down, huh? No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe I haven't turned it down. We, we, so <laughs> yeah. I love it. If you had a message to give out to uh, the young adult world right now and everything that's that's going on, what would that message be? Oh man, so I have a senior in high school and this is not what he thought his senior year would look like. You know, this is not what the college application process would look like. This is not, it's not what I, we intended to give them. And so I would just tell them, you're doing amazing. We are sorry that you're having to deal with all of this. You're blowing us away by how smart and capable you are. But also I love the, um, the mantra now that people are saying it's okay not to be okay if you need to have a day or two to feel like this is crappy and this was not how this was supposed to look that is also fine too you know be gentle with yourselves but also please know that the adults in your life are rooting for you as maybe never before we are cheering you on and, and we love you that is it, it couldn't ask for a better better message so where can people find out more information about you uh, so I'm online on Twitter and Instagram, just Ali Condi, A-L-L-Y-C-O-N-D-I-E. And then anywhere books are sold, um, Amazon, independent bookstores, um, my books are there. So, so that's where I am. Well, Ali, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. Absolutely well, thank you. wonderful. Thank you, Sylvia. These have been fantastic questions. I mean, I expected nothing less from you, but, but it's been such a, such a delight to, for me to get to talk to you. Uh, thank you. You can find us on all of your popular podcast platforms and of course our website, sylviame.com. Stay safe, 
stay healthy and stay tuned.